um, the day was, uh, let me, how do I explain this? Someone on campus really thought through a series of miscommunications and whatever, they really thought there was a shooter on campus and reported it. The shooter drill had been, there was not the shooter on campus. The shooter drill, well, the shooter alert will never be a drill. So every time you hear that, it is because there is someone thinking that it's really going down. Now the person who thought that that was happening on campus. Sorry, he's recording for us. Oh, all right, well. I want to catch my breath then. That's embarrassing. <sighs> okay. Um, the reason the, the active shooter, um, it'll never be a drill. We will always take it serious. The person who thought there was an actual shooter on campus did exactly the right thing. Okay. So even though they, they, they were wrong, even though it shut down the campus for an hour, they did what we want them to do. We want, if you, if you are convinced that there is something happening tell someone. Now, does everyone know the number for security? Okay, so how do you call, how do you call the police? Okay, so our security is 6911. Okay, so lock that down. You call Chattanooga Police 911, you call security 6911, okay? Um, so if you ever think that something needs to be reported, it's better to be safe than sorry. Now again, do your, you know, do as much due diligence as you can, but don't be a full afraid to, to kind of send out the alert. So people got alerted in the ED or whoever it initiated, I can't remember, but kind of floated up. Police were alerted. Security was alerted. Somehow the news got wind of it. The news was reporting that there was no shooter before we had confirmed there was no shooter. So here's the deal. When a shooter, not drill, when, a, when that alarm is sounded, a, if you see something, call 6911 or call 911. If, unless you have seen someone call 911 and you know something is happening, go ahead and call. Don't assume it's already been called in. Because um, actually on this, this shooter drill, not drill, I keep saying drill, on this shooter incident that was false, no one actually called 911. They called, talked to security here, talk to a police officer in the emergency department, like it just got escalated, but no one actually called 911. If you think something is happening, call 911. If you see something happening, don't assume your friend called it in, go ahead and call it in. So these are just things that we're learning from this. Um, it was a false alarm, but it was actually a really good false alarm because it felt really real. And it's kind of identified some issues in our department where we didn't know what to do. So this was a good, this is actually a really good thing. The institution responded exactly like they're supposed to. If you didn't get the alert, you can opt into the alert so you get alerts when this is happening because if you're on your way to work and you don't know stuff is going down, you'd probably not choose to walk into the building, right? So having that alert go to your phone is a good thing. Um, what else? So anyway, we wrapped it all up. It was a false alarm, but everything, This the good news is our system did exactly what it was supposed to do. They went through all of the checks and balances. Um, the right people were alerted. The right people were activated. It was awesome. So for our department, what does that look like? Okay, if you're in the pharmacy, you're actually in one of the safest places in the hospital. So if you're in the pharmacy, stay in the pharmacy. One thing we can do is close and lock that door from the admin hallway because that door by my office is glass. So we don't want to stay in the admin hallway. Get out of the admin hallway and go into the pharmacy, lock that door. If you're on the floor rounding with medical team or delivering meds, Go ahead and get with the nursing staff because they have safe places they've identified and you can just stay with them. If you can't find anybody, go into a med room. Lock, you know, the med rooms are locked. Get down low, away from the windows and just be in the med room. Do not try to make it back across campus to the pharmacy, right? We don't know where the person is. Just get with the nursing staff or get into the med room. Nursing staff would be preferred. Okay, any questions about that? Oh, final thing, if the news reports that it's resolved, don't believe the news. Don't call security asking for questions. They need to keep that line open. Everything will come from me or the, your direct supervisor. So count on us to give you the information we have at hand, but do not believe the news because they're reporting third, fourth, fifth hand, right? So make sure that you're getting it from me or from some of the admin or whoever we kind of appoint as point person. Okay, any other questions about that? All right, moving on. So the first thing we need to talk about from my space, my, I've got the top two points here. 
First thing, GPO conversion. GPO, that's a group purchasing org organization. What they do is they get all a bunch of hospitals together and they say, hospitals, we're gonna go to this manufacturer and we're gonna tell this manufacturer, hey, we'll buy your medicine against your competitor if you give us a deal. So like they'll go to Lantis and say, hey, Lantis, um, Nova Nordis, or I think that's Nova Nordis. Anyway, Johnson Johnson, whatever. We'll buy you instead of Levamir if you give us a better price. And so we are moving on February 1st, we're moving from Vizient, who is our current GPO, to Health Trust, which is gonna be our new GPO. What that means for us. Well, Vizient has gotten a bunch of hospitals together and they've gone to certain manufacturers to ask for discounts. Health Trust might have gone to the same manufacturers, but they might have gone to different ones. So on February 1st, we might be purchasing different NDCs. Some of them will be like for like, you know, we purchase this manufacturer on, you know, fluticasone, and now we're purchasing, purchasing this manufacturer, no big deal. Some of them will actually be changing ther therapy. We will be moving from Levamir to Lantis, potentially Simbacort to Dolera. Like we're gonna be making some therapeutic changes depending on what is dictated by the GPO. We're still working through a 4,000 line document so that we can find out exactly how we need to navigate this, but we should have that locked down relatively near future knowing what direction we're heading. Just knowing on the front lines, I know Wendy's like, <laughs> yeah, having a stroke in the back row. Um, but we will, be, we will be converting GPO. So if you hear us talk about that, that's what that deal is. The other thing, password protection. So as of December 1st, if you do not have SailPoint, um, if you have not engaged with SailPoint at all, you will be locked out of the system. SailPoint is an application that sits between you and our IT department and allows you to set up a password that you can manage yourself. What it's doing for us is it's mandating um, that everyone have a very strong password. So you have to have at least 12 digits. It has to have uppercase, lowercase, special characters, et cetera. That's always been our policy, but there's no way to enforce your passwords. Well, now there will be. So sale point, you'll go in, it takes about two minutes. Um, all of the information has been emailed to you. You go in, you um, enroll, you just put in your information, your security questions, and then um, you will be in sale point. It's not gonna prompt you to set a new password, just go ahead and set a new password. Then you will be set for the next six months. But if you don't do this by December 1st, you cannot access the system. So they're, they're working towards making us more secure. The other thing that is, um, other options, so that's mandatory. There is an option to use something called Keeper Password. And what Keeper Password does is it functions like, if you ever go on Chrome or Edge, and your browser says, would you like me to save your password? And then it will auto-populate for you. A, do not do that. If you have done that, tell me or tell your friend, and they will help you delete all of your passwords from your browser. That is a huge no-no, and I'll talk about why in a second. But Keeper is the safe way to do that. It's really easy to use. You do not have to memorize your passwords for every single thing that you are a member of here at Erlanger. Um, it'll memorize them for you, but it'll do it in a very secure way. You can also download it to your phone. So you can do it with your home passwords. You know, your spouse can do it or your partner or whatever. Um, so it's a way to secure our passwords. I strongly encourage you to consider it. I don't want a uh, pharmacy to be a reason that we have to move to paper charts. So what happened at Memorial, they got breached. They had to move to paper charting for about six weeks. And the MAR was an Excel document that pharmacy kept control of. We don't wanna do that. So please, 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 if you have, um, A, if anything's saved on your browser as a password, delete it. If you want that ease where you don't have to remember, you want it to auto-populate, use Keeper password. Now in a minute, we're gonna talk about Pharmacy Keeper. That's different. So there's two keepers, one for pharmacy, and then one for passwords. But if you have any questions about that, let me know. Does this work? Okay, good. Hello, so we are um, gonna be starting a new study through the, um, with our trauma center and um, it's gonna, it's called the TAP study. It's the trauma and PCC study. Um, the primary investigator is uh, Dr. Maxwell and your pharmacy contacts will either be uh, myself or Bree. 
So just a little bit of an overview of what the study is. It's a phase three prospective multi-center randomized double-blind placebo-controlled study. It evaluates the efficacy and safety of um, BE116, which is K-Centra, so I'm just going to say K-Centra going forward. Um, uh, it's when it's administered early to patients who've had traumatic injury and confirmed or suspected acute major bleeding predicted to receive the massive transplant, uh, massive transfusion protocol. Uh, it's a, a standard um, resuscitation methods are going to be used um, with either with or without um, the single dose of k giving with it. So we're going to be treating patients um, the same way we always do, except for some patients will be getting the k drug and some will be getting a placebo as blinded, so we won't be able to tell what's what. Uh, the primary endpoint is all-cause mortality within six hours after the start of the infusion. So that's a little bit of a background on what it is and uh, what we're doing. Um, so what does that look like for us? So these uh, kits are going to come in. Um, the kit is going to contain three vials of either PCC or placebo and three vials of standard water for, uh, for dilution. Um, each vial is going to be a thousand units of PCC and uh, the, it's going to be completely weight based. So if you get 75, if you're 75 kilograms, you're going to get two vials or 2000 units. If you're greater than 75 kilograms, you're going to get three, uh, 3,000 units or three vials. And this isn't going to be like our typical case central where we go in and we calculate the exact number of units. These are going to be standardized, either 2,000 or 3,000. So just to know that this is going to be a stat order, um, the infusion has to be started within 90 minutes of the patient arriving to the system. So this, you know, we may get, you know, it could be, an, we may only have an hour by the time we get noticed. So it's going to be considered a stat medication. So I'm going to go over the pharmacist workflow and kind of just very general, and then I'll go in a little bit deeper. So um, similar to our heparin, how we have our heparin drip group, where we opt into the, to the messaging group, we will have a tap group that we will, that we will opt into. So um, whenever we get ready to start a patient on this therapy, a red shirt will um, send a message through that chat group and we'll receive it. Unfortunately, that is not going to be ready until March. So it'll probably be more of a phone call um, when we first get started for these patients. So once we're notified that we have a patient, we need to contact the red shirt. Um, and I've listed the phone number there and we need to verify the patient's name, their MRN, their weight, and where we have to deliver the drug. So next, we will remove the drug from the OmniCell. Um, it's going to be in the OmniCell under TAP BE116, um, and it's going to prompt you to remove it from the refrigerator H, and it's going to be in the spot four. Um, the next thing we will have to do is after we get the drug, we will enter the order. Um, the order will be under, if you type in Kcentra, it will pull up the IRB uh, 116 factor four placebo panel. And then we will prepare the medication. The case, this case intra uh, medication is prepared the same way that we prepare a normal case intra. So flow, you'll, you'll make it the same way that you make any of the other case intras. Um, so the box that the medication is on is going to have two stickers on it. And I know it seems all very abstract right now, but, um, the peel-off stickers will be attached to two different sheets of paper. Um, one is the IP administration form, which goes with the drug to the red shirts. The other is a kit. Is the other one is the drug, um, you, the drug kit, um, and I'll show you those what those look like in a second. Um, so once you finish making the drug, uh, we need the box, the vials, everything that you use to prepare the drug put it in a bag uh, with the IP kit usage number and you can put it on my desk. So I don't really have a desk. So, <laughs> um, so I'm using Jeff's desk. When you come into the clinical office and you make a left, it's that first desk on your first desk on your left. You can just place it there. Okay. So order entry, what does it look like? Um, so like I said before, you enter the K-Centra, select the IRB B116 protocol. And then it will, this is actually what it looks like. It's already built in Epic. It'll pull up and it'll say 
patient less than or greater than 75 kilograms, you'll pick the correct dose. And then this will, this will pop up. Um, you see under here where it says lot number, um, under the lot number, you wanna place the kit number here, the kit number that will be on the box. Um, that way we just have a way to link which patient got which kit inside of Epic. So you'll process that and fill it just like you would any other order. So as I mentioned before, preparation looks exactly the same way as it does uh, currently with our case centra. We'll be doing the same thing where after we put the vials together, they'll go in a empty sterile bag. And then we need to place that IP administration form with the drug to be delivered to, the, to wherever it's going. Okay, so this is what the IP administration form looks like. Um, this is the one that's gonna go with the drug for the red shirts to fill out and keep up with. So you just take one of the stickers off the box, slap it on there and send it with the drug. This is the form that stays with the pharmacy. It is called the IP kit usage form. And this is something that we will fill out. So you'll slap a sticker on that. Um, you'll put the, the check the box that the drug was administered and then just complete your name, signature, date. And then that will, that form will go in the bag with the leftover boxes, syringes, everything that we used, empty vials, vials that we didn't use. And that's really it. Um, so I'm sure that there'll be more questions whenever we actually start doing it and it's we actually physically have something that I, you can see and look at. Um, does anyone have any questions? The site visit is in December, um, the second week of December. And then after we have the site visit, we'll have probably some more data that I'll be able to put together and there'll be an SOP of exactly how to do it on the X drive. So does anybody have any questions that they can think of right offhand that they... Well, you can ask me later or find me later. I'm sure there'll be more questions when it starts. Thanks. Okay, so now we're just gonna review USP chapter changes. Um, as of November 1, USP 797, 800, and 795, um, have go their proposed changes have gone into effect. Um, we're currently working on stabilizing these changes prior to January 1 to stay compliant with the Tennessee Board of Pharmacy. So what does that look like? So compounded sterile products will no longer be categorized as low, medium, or high risk. They will now be categorized as category one, two, or three. And most, if not all of the CSP that we compound will be considered category two. Um, I have put what the new beyond use dating will be um, with those. So at controlled room temperature, it will be four days. In the refrigerator, it will be 10 days. And in the freezer, it will be 45 days. Now your EPIC CNR is not going to reflect this at the moment. Um, the current beyond use dating from the old 797 is more stringent than the new. So right now we're just going to keep the old until EPIC is able to uplift and we're able to go through all of the recipes and change the beyond use dating. If you guys see something that we're wasting a lot of or something that you feel needs to be updated more urgently, you can let us know and we'll get Epic to do it sooner rather than later. Practical exam changes. So this is our glove fingertips and media fills. They now must be completed every six months. It was every 12 months, but now we will do it every six months. And the other thing with that is that there is a post compounding surface sample that must be done with every media fill. So the area that you just did your media fill on, they will do a surface sample to see if there's any growth there. The other change is the action levels. Once you do your gowning and garbing and your fingertips with that, you cannot have any growth. If you have one CFU, you will have to redo your gowning and garbing fingertips. With your media fill test, you can have up to three CFUs. If you have more than three, you have to redo your whole media fill. Um, compound and fingertip test. And that is based on the count with both hands. So before it was one hand versus the other hand, now it's combined together. So zero after garbing and three after the media field test. And the reason that it's more strict now is that they want to make sure that people are introducing um, 
introducing bacteria into the clean room after they garb. So they wanna make sure that everything is completely sterile before you walk into the buffer room to start compounding. Pressure changes. Um, positive pressure is now just a minimum of 0 0.02. There is no range for that. And negative pressure in our hazardous buffer room has to be between negative 0 0.01 and negative 0 0.03. Um, what that means is if our pressure is outside of that range in the hazardous buffer room, that just means that we cannot use that beyond you stating that I showed you guys a couple of slides back. We will have to use our 12 hour beyond you stating that we do when we're out of compliance. All right, so now we're gonna jump over to USP 795. So this is gonna be our smog enemas, our lactulose enemas, and everything that we compound over at the sink in the main pharmacy. Um, you will still need to remove your jewelry and do hand hygiene as if you were going into the IV space. Um, you wanna wash with up to your elbows with soap and water for up to 30 seconds. Put on non-sterile gloves before you start compounding. And also you wanna make sure that we clean the surfaces and the floors around the sink at minimum daily. This will be updated in Pharmacy Keeper as an activity for all of the technicians and staff who document things in Pharmacy Keeper. Also, equipment will need to be cleaned after each use. So we cannot leave the graduated sink cylinders in the sink or any of the materials that we use to compound in the sink. We will have to clean that area, wipe it down and make sure that it's good to go. All right, so now we're gonna talk about how you get to your training competencies in Pharmacy Keeper. At August um, staff meeting, we talked about updating competencies for all of the staff, where we will have exams for certain things, uh, quizzes, as well as acknowledgements, and all of that is going to be in Pharmacy Keeper. So this is how you log into Pharmacy Keeper. Everybody at the main campus now has a Pharmacy Keeper login. If you have never logged in, the username is the same as your Epic or computer login. You go to the website that I've listed here. This will be emailed out to all of the attendees. And your password, if it's your first time logging in, will be 12345. It will prompt you to change your password once you log in the first time. And the site ID is eMain. This is what the website looks like when you go to log in. So once you log in, you're at the dashboard, the activity dashboard, and this is what it will look like. You're going to click this little drop down menu. And it will take, it will have five um, prompts right there. You will click on the training prompt and it will take you to a training dashboard and it will say how many are scheduled, completed and failed. You're gonna click on your training. It will then list out all of the training that you have that needs to be done. And I can log in so you guys can see this in real time. Okay. So while she's doing that, um, some of this training is um, stuff you've done before as far as fingertips and a hazardous training, the hazardous med training, there's also an EOL. Some of this training um, you'll see on EOLs, so some pharmacy training comes from EOLs. This is the other application where it will be pharmacy specific training. These are all DNB or OSHA requirements, so all of this is required training that we have to do that we're training. So this is one of your sources where you have to keep your POLs up to date. Um, so once you log in and you're in the training dashboard, this is what it looks like. You're going to click on my training and it's going to list out everything that you need to have done um, as well as the due dates. So everything except for your practical exam and your sterile compounding competency checklist um, will be due on December 31st. So for the pharmacist, you have your operational competency that is new. We have not had that before. You have your heparin competency that is also new since we are going live with heparin. Um, there's a hazardous drug attestation for everyone to go in there and do. So everything that you need to do will be logged in there. Um, does anyone have any questions about that? Okay. All right, Emily is now going to come up. We're gonna go over a couple of policies that um, have come up in the last few weeks.
<clears throat> Hello, this will be pretty painless. Um, we're gonna start adding a few of these into monthly staff meetings just to make sure everybody knows where to go to find information. Um, everything's is housed now on policy stat, so everybody should have access. And there's a clickable link on Epic when you log in uh, to go to policy stat as well. Um, this first one I think comes up a few times a year. Um, and I don't love the name of it. So if I'm pulling the audience for better names, places where you would go to find this particular policy. Um, but this, this is the policy that would uh, dictate what the nursing ratio and what uh, monitoring needs to happen for medications that don't necessarily need to go to an ICU level of care, um, but do require extra monitoring or special um, circumstances. So this is the policy, but this is probably um, the document that you guys would be looking for um, that tells you what the nursing ratio needs to be for certain medications if the patient would need to be on telemetry um, or have other um, monitoring in place. Um, so the big thing here is that pharmacy is oftentimes the first stop, um, the provider places in order, they want to give the medication, um, but pharmacy will get this and realize that the patient is in a unit that often doesn't have this nursing ratio. And so we're the first call usually to nurse manager or to the provider to say, we've got to move the patient or they've got to adjust nursing ratios um, in order to be able to give this medication. Um, and I just want you guys to feel confident in you know, being that stop, go by the policy, the pharmacy administration and hospital administration will back you on this. If the patient needs to be moved to another unit, then they need to be moved. Um, and you don't, you know, if you get any pushback on that, let myself or Julia, Ashley, Amanda know. Uh, but the policy has been PNT approved. This is what we'll stick by. So if the if the patient has to be moved, then don't verify the order until you've verified that the nursing ratio is appropriate, the telemetry is appropriate. Um, and, and that the patient will be, you know, monitored appropriately. Do you have any questions on this one? Okay. Um, another one, home medications for hospital administration. First and foremost, we would like to use as many of the medications that we house in the pharmacy, in the hospital as possible. Um, we will only allow for the use of home medications if it is something that we don't have an adequate substitute for. So a lot of chemo medications, hepatitis C, HIV treatments that the patient is on and stable on um, that should be continued for the time that they're hospitalized, but we cannot provide for the patient um, is when we would allow for the use of these. Um, so if the patient's medications are not going to be used, they should never come to the pharmacy. They should go with security and be locked up every single time. We cannot be responsible for them. We cannot hold them for them. We cannot tube them back to the nurse. Um, security needs to get involved. Um, if they will be used during the inpatient stay, the medication will need to be brought back down to the pharmacy or the pharmacist can go up to bedside, verify that the medication has been, is in date and stored appropriately, that we have an active order placed by the provider and continuing that medication is appropriate as you would for any verification of medication in the hospital um, and an order placed on the MAR using the verified home medication um, MAR prompt and then stored in the PSB. Uh, some caveats are things I would like to add to that. If you can, if it's a really high, if it's a high cost medication um, or controlled, putting the count that we are receiving um, that the patient's brought in just so there's no problem on the back end. Um, when they leave and they have that many less that we've administered, we have documentation of every single administration and the amount that we got in on the front end um, can help alleviate any problems on the back end. Um, and we are going to reach back out to nursing leadership uh, to make sure that when there are home medications verified on the MAR, that we are having those leave with the patient as often as possible. <laughs> But that, should, that responsibility is not on the pharmacist or the pharmacy. They should never be brought back down to us. We don't have a way to get them back to the patient. Um, and in the staff meeting earlier, Julia mentioned, um, 
if somebody calls looking for lost items or left items, they're not going to come looking for the pharmacy. They're going to go to security. So, also, yes, come on. <laughs> um, technicians, when you're at the Omni sale and there's a PSB and it's telling you that the patient is discharged, go ahead and take it out and give it to the nurse manager or the charge nurse, the CSL, so that they can make sure that it leaves with the patient. Do not bring it back to the pharmacy. We don't need it down there at all. So for the recording, um, pharmacist, if a technician asks you to put an eye vent on the patient's chart, just saying uh, a paper trail of where the medication has been, if they took it out of the PSB and had given it to a nurse, we can eye vent on that just to say, this is where it went <laughs> out of our hands. All right, and then lastly, um, we oh yes, Rob. I can try. Yesterday, um, we carried these medications, but we had an alpha gal patient, and they had their own meds with them that they were okay to take with them. We carried those same medications. Is there a way to do an addendum to this for alpha gal patients that are Is it they have their own meds? Um, that might be hard to figure out. I would be okay with that um, for the, because that is one very specific instance and it does take a lot of time to verify NDCs on the back end for these patients. If they have approved medications. Um, they brought in all their own meds, but it was the same things that we carried. So. But we might not carry the, the, the NDC that has been approved. I think that would be fair and and it is quite a big load on the pharmacist that gets that consult to verify mm -hmm. Agree. Will do. Thank you, Rob. Sure. Um, so the question was in the setting of a patient with an alpha gal allergy, um, would we be able to use their home medications that have already been um, checked and approved um, for their use? And the answer is yes. We will take this to PNT and discuss very specific instances where our products could potentially cause harm to the patient because of the additives um, or the formulation. All right, and then last policy for this month, um, as always, we want to increase and improve adverse drug event um, documentation and document and e-safe reporting. Um, and so there is a policy here that outlines kind of what determines an adverse drug event. I think all of us, uh, at least the pharmacists are pretty well, well aware of this, uh, but, but documentation and reporting does continue to be lower than probably should be expected. Um, and so we can pull up, if anybody is unaware of how to get to the eSafe um, homepage and put these in, uh, please let us know. We're happy to go over that. Um, these can be adverse drug events that happened while the patient was here or that led to them coming here. Um, both are appropriate to report um, at, to the eSafe um, uh, website. Um, we've also discussed increasing it events and how and um, on the back end having Ashley and the med safety team evaluate those and then putting in e-safes um, when time is um, doesn't allow you to do that right away. So we want to make this as painless as possible for everybody on the front end reporting these. Um, so if there's a way that we can help on the back end or make that less time consuming, please um, reach out right now. I think. The best we discussed this morning was putting in events and then having somebody go back through and sort of filling in boxes. Yeah, that's a, that's a, that's a, that's a, 
<laughs> so yes, um, so for now, if you can put them in, put them in. If you have suggestions um, or feedback, let us know. And we will work together as a group to improve reporting. Questions, comments? Be back next time with more policies. Uh, just this last hour. So um, I'm having to answer calls about where your stuff is. Is everyone okay? Again, it's not confirmed. Just in process today, a very special day um, for all things. So make sure you're getting an alert for your work on the office. And if someone drops a backpack and you're in the room, that building stays in the schedule. So that's the teacher there. They're working on it. That's why I'm having a job. Fun, fun. Okay. <laughs> Back to Hepburn. I just want to start by saying, I understand if everybody wants to groan and roll their eyes, but I want to say thank you so much. I know this is kind of pharmacist central and there's not so much tech involvement in the heparin process, but I know you guys have supported us a lot in giving the pharmacists more time to respond to heparin issues and learnings about this. Um, so for our pharmacists in the group here today, our heparin, pharmacy dose heparin initiative is going live on December 11th at 10 a.m. 10 a.m. because we're going to have more individuals to help triage um, questions that are sure to come from nursing. So 12, 11, 23 at 10 o'clock in the morning. What does this mean? At that time, um, the functionality of the heparin calculator and the nurse ability to um, use that calculator to figure out what the next appropriate dose of heparin is based on labs will go away. And it um, will fall to pharmacy or pharmacists as the responsible party for reviewing PTTs um, as we have been um, practicing in our retrospective process. And it will become the responsibility of the pharmacist to then place orders on the MAR for the appropriate heparin rate. So I'm not going to go into the specifics. I'm not going to show screenshots today. Um, all of this has been released in the EOL uh, that's now available. Everybody has 30 days to complete that. So right before we go live with this process, um, I just wanted to let you guys know of a few particulars to pay attention to, because this is one of those EOLs that you can just like click, click, click. There's not a whole lot of test questions, um, but it's really important to recognize that one of the most important pieces of this build is that um, although nursing staff can turn the heparin infusion on and on at, at the pump, on and off at the pump without us knowing, pharmacy will be responsible for placing hold orders on the MAR or placing start or restart orders, which means the nurse will not have anything to chart on on the MAR until the pharmacist has put in that order. And so um, we have built an order now that it will be electronic. It's, a, it's available in the Epic Play space. If anybody's curious and just wants to see what these heparin orders look like, you can get in Epic Play and, and mess around with it starting today. Um, but anytime a provider wants to start or stop a heparin drip, or if the protocol says to pause it, um, that has to be accompanied by an electronic order. So that means patients who are going to have their heparin drip held before they go for um, cardiac catheterization. We will receive an order for that from the physician that says the date and the time to stop it, as well as the date and time to resume. So going live on the 11th, be aware that nurses are going to have a lot of questions for us. Um, I'm going to make sure that pharmacy is prepared as as possible, as much as we can be. The only major difference that you're gonna see pharmacists is that um, we're doing everything at this moment except for profiling those rate changes. So that will be a piece we, we bring forward. But when you receive messages from nurse that communicate that they need it, it held or paused on the, on the MAR or restarted, we are going to start responding that requires an EPIC order. So as you go through the EOL, pay attention to those details. Um, also, the heparin competency on the ex, um, ex drive and pharmacy keeper 
Um, it, I think there's about 18 questions. Do it with a friend if you want. All the answers can be found um, in the policy that is on the X drive. So all of that information that's about our retrospective process is replaced now with the information and the policy for this our new live process. So you can find the answers there and you can also control F search that document where um, I, I saved and posted everybody's accumulated heparin questions over the past six months. Um, so that's all I'm going to say about that. Nurses, nurses have an EOL today. Providers are going to have all kinds of education. Um, everybody knows about this. Um, the same education that, um, that we get in the EOL has gone out to nursing. So that way, when you receive a question from a new nurse or someone who didn't pay attention to the EOL and they say, well, where, who decides this? Where does this information come from? We have the backup and support to say, this is what you received. This is the language that gives us, you know, these instructions um, to make these changes. And, you know, growing pains, three to six months, we'll have this all, you know, um, you know, hopefully going smoothly, but just bear with me. Um, let me know how things are going. And if anybody would like, I'm going to set up a time um, for maybe a Zoom or something similar where I can take 15 minutes to walk through what the orders will look like and things like that, um, just to make sure everybody's comfortable before December 11th. Are there any questions about heparin or anything anybody wants to share at this point? Okay. All right. Thanks, everybody. One thing that was discussed earlier this morning. So when the smart pumps go live sometime next year, um, all of those rates will still have to choose that nurse to choose the rates. So the work will increase as we put in pumps. So Julia just mentioned the really, really awesome news that when we have um, brought in our new smart pumps, pharmacy will no longer have to be watching for the nurse to make the rate change on the IV pump and document that on the MAR. Once that has been documented, the pharmacist can automatically see that and be notified. So the delay of waiting for nursing staff to make that change at the pump within an hour of the start or the order time um, will be going away, which will really streamline our work. So again, this is gonna to continue to get easier, so. Does anyone have any questions about anything that was discussed today? All right, if not, that is the end. That's all we have for today. Thank you all. Oh. So we are looking for another three function analyst. We have a couple of tech positions to open um, as far as giving some more PR tech, the day shift, IV tech, uh, and the other resources here at our tech lab. Um, and then an IV pharmacist. So we have been a pretty front set with IV pharmacists. So we train with uh, maybe your stewardship, uh, but it's more like.